Okay, so uh, good, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, bearing with the <clears throat> shift of venue. Um, this room has a somewhat different feel to it, and uh, we'll try to bear with the, um, the different acoustics as well as um, the seating arrangement. Um, it's, it's really a um, great pleasure to be with you again this morning to uh, continue our discussion of many of these important topics that we uh, started on in the past two days. Um, uh, I'd like to begin, as I typically do, with a retrospective, um, uh, talking, uh, reflecting a little bit on what we've um, what we've uh, encountered, uh, particularly yesterday, um, uh, putting it into context, uh, and um, then I'd like to go on to uh, discuss uh, some of what lies before us today. So uh, yesterday, um, we uh, began the day with uh, introducing um, the first of several methods that um, uh, we are going to be applying here in the course of the week. Um, um, and specifically, we looked at a, uh, a method that's uh, notable in terms of its uh, simplicity, um, its uh, capacity to be applied in different fashions, including an unsupervised fashion where we can, we can induce the, uh, or abduct the model from the uh, available data. Um, and uh, that was uh, hidden markup models. Um, I argued that hidden Markov models were only arguably a system science techniques. System science dealing with these systems where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, almost always not linear, because with linear systems, uh, uh, it's it, there's very much an ability to reason from the parts directly to the whole. Um, but uh, within system science, um, a, central, a central point of interest is in the use of dynamic models. Um, models which characterize some underlying situation that evolves over time. And while that first type of modeling that we examined, hidden Markov modeling, was not a strong case of a system science model, it was uh, very notably a dynamic model, a model where we have some depicted state. As we say, it's latent in the sense that we can't, typically can't observe it directly, but it's evolving over time. And it's evolving, in fact, according to a linear process. Um, where each state has a certain probability of transitioning to each other state. Within the hidden Markov model context, there's this underlying latent state, and we're interested in inferring what it is and in understanding the patterns of transition between different states. But we do so, as we typically do in the world, with very, very imperfect information. Our inferences about the world and our inferences in hidden Markov models are, are stymied by the fact that we're dealing with information that we observe that's incomplete, doesn't tell us the full story for sure. It merely hints often at the underlying situation. It's often ambiguous, any given reading um, will give uh, uh, some uncertainty about its real implications. And yet we're trying to probe this key underlying situation that's of such importance. This is the situation with hidden Markov models. Um, and uh, in some cases, the data that we are observing is only intermittently available. So a lot of the time, we may not have information. And situations like this surround us. You know, whether it's a mechanical problem in our car, we hear this occasional noise and we're not quite sure what it means. Um, it could mean, you know, the uh, 
Um, the car uh, fan belts is, uh, is, is acting up, or it could mean that there's, uh, there's something uh, in the, the engine mechanism that really needs to be fixed urgently. We're often left guessing about what the underlying situation is because we have this ambiguous data. If we're dealing with people, um, youth at risk, and we hear comments that we're not quite sure how to take, we worry because it may indicate a, an underlying issue of concern, or it may be it may be overblown and, and we're we're misreading it. So often in the world we have some underlying situation that we're trying to probe, and the data that we have is is, is highly imperfect, incomplete, sparse often, highly ambiguous, noisy. Needless to say, this is true in, in big ways about, about data at the aggregate level, but also at the individual level. And we saw yesterday how we could use a hidden Markov model to infer, according to certain algorithms, we noted, we noted essentially four big big types of, um, of, of calculations. One was calculation of a, of a likelihood, a likelihood that a model would yield some sequence of observations over time. But we also had a forward-backward algorithm that calculated at any one time, what's the probability we're in each underlying state? A state perhaps of suicidal ideation of concrete nature versus um, uh, non-concrete suicidal ideation versus non, uh, non-suicidal at all. Um, or perhaps uh, it's an outbreak versus non-outbreak state for, for Saskatoon. These are different inference tasks with different underlying situations, but um, the forward-backward algorithm would, would allow us to put a probability on being in each of those states for a particular model. The third algorithm we looked at yesterday was the Viterbi algorithm. And what that gives us is a picture over time of the single most likely sequence. Um, so it, it tells us not just at this time the probability of being in each of the stages of such and such, but what's the single most likely story that's played out in terms of, you know, this person was. Um, Initially, non, non uh, did not have suicidal ideation, and then at this point, they may have developed uh, non-concrete suicidal ideation that briefly escalated to concrete, but then fell back to non-concrete, persisted in that, in that uh, for a while, and then quickly engaged in concrete and, and attempted suicide. Um, it gives us that that story for that person that's most likely sort of a turby algorithm would give. And we finally mentioned the Baum Welch algorithm. I actually didn't introduce it formally, I sort of made mention to it and wave my hands at it, but but fundamentally it consists of an algorithm by which we could and I Jeff will have to correct me if I misuse the term abduct the um, the the structure or excuse me the uh, uh, the transition probabilities in the model based on observed data. Um, abduct not in a criminal justice sense, of course, but uh, in the sense of Peirce, um, uh, Charles, Charles Peirce, um, of whom Jeff could speak of, with some length. Um, so here, uh, we're dealing with four different algorithms that it can help take a hidden Markov model and give us information about it. Um, the last one, we're actually deducing a hidden Markov model, and we saw there's another technique, maximum likelihood estimation, which basically allows us to try to probe what's the likely structure of this model that's given rise to the data, where given such a model, we can apply that, we, uh, given such a model, we can compute its likelihood of having produced the data. How, that's how we find the most likely model. And then, given that model as well, we could ask about the single most likely sequence um, of underlying states that would account for the data we do see, and 
we would um, be able to ask at a given time what's the probability of being in a different state through the forward backward algorithm. Hidden Markov models are, are very, very useful. And um, like many types of machine learning tools, we apply them in different ways. So we had a, what's called a supervised learning way of building them, where we actually <coughs> have a privileged knowledge for a few cases sometimes of so-called label data or ground truth data. We know what the underlying situation is. And we use it to build a hidden Markov model that captures those patterns as parsimoniously as possible. possible. Uh, knowing the underlying situation, we can deduce the transition probabilities between states. We can deduce what the so-called emission matrices are, the probability of observing something given being in a state. And we can then take that model and use it to probe other data, data where we don't know the privilege situation. That's supervised learning. We have this privileged set of data that allows us a shortcut for building the model. In unsupervised learning, by contrast, we have some underlying data, and we're looking for a model that most parsimoniously explains it um, with the understanding that we might then use that model for very different sorts of, of data as well. So there are supervised and unsupervised learning. And with uh, supervised learning, where we do know the underlying situation, there's a training phase and an evaluation phase where we use some of the labeled data to train the model on some of it to judge it. And we often do that in a round robin sort of way called cross-validation, where, we, where we're looking for a model that has uh, generalizability. We train it in one set, we test it on the others, and we're looking for a model that does well in both. It is an overfit to the original data. So those are hidden Markov models. But they taught us some principles, hopefully, that carried over to our coverage in the afternoon of a very important topic that will stay with us today. And that is the topic of our particle filtering. In markup models were specific to a case, a very simple character. Number one, we had discrete states, typically categorical in nature. So we're non-outbreak or outbreak, say in one case. Or another one, we might label someone as being a non-suicidal ideation, non-concrete suicidal ideation, concrete suicidal ideation categories in which they could be located. Um, uh, we talked about many of them involving postures of the body, for example, um, as well. But that situation does not mirror our needs often. With most system science models, and nature-based models, compartmental models, certainly fall into this category. While we sometimes deal with categorical states Often we're dealing with a state of the world that we're interested in inferring and trying to, trying to probe, trying to understand, trying to get a best guess of, which is continuous in nature, meaning we could have more or less of something. It's not just we're in state A, B, or C. It's we could have more people who are susceptible and, and fewer infected, or vice versa. So, so we have continuous underlying states. And we saw some of those models in the afternoon. Oh, uh, yeah, presented uh, a model with uh, measles and, and another one with pertussis. Some of them had just maybe four states in them, some, uh, each of which could have uh, values that could um, range continuously up to the size of the population. But some of her models, like her model with, uh, uh, which had 32 age groups, had hundreds and hundreds of stocks associated with it, hundreds and hundreds of state variables. And we're interested in inferring that underlying situation. In addition, the Markov model was subject to, was constrained to, was straightjacketed to have fixed transition probabilities amongst the different states. Regardless of how long you've been in a state, you have the same transition probability to leave. And 
That was something which limited its flexibility. I argued they're still very useful despite this, but in the afternoon, we were looking at model structures with Anikita and Xiaoyan's presentation, which were not so constrained. Um, they were much more flexible than that. My chance of getting infected on a per, say, day basis as a susceptible with measles, if I were susceptible to measles, my chance of getting infected on a per day or per week or per month basis would not just be a fixed quantity. It would depend on the number of people out there who have measles right now. And we, the models that we saw in the afternoon reflected that. But they shared the underlying situation that they're depicting a latent underlying situation evolving over time where we have imperfect information and we're seeking to estimate it. And where we have one or more sequences of these imperfect information coming in. And where, in fact, we have to formulate likelihood functions, which, uh, which state what's the likelihood of observing something conditional on being in an underlying state, which were some of the hallmarks, indeed, of hidden Markov models. But they transitioned to particle filtering. With particle filtering, we were inferring the underlying state of the system in a more sophisticated way than we explored with, with uh, hidden Markov models. With hidden Markov models, often the tradition is that you, op you, you are trying to seek a privileged model that best explains the situation. And many of my students have applied this to types of problems, from outbreak detection to detection of postures, um, for example. Tina is applying it to deduce the underlying state of a phone with respect to whether the screen is on, recognizing that there's imperfect and, uh, and somewhat idiosyncratic information about that that's only occasionally revealed. But in those cases, we're arriving at a single model estimate that we believe to be most efficacious in explaining the data. The truth is hidden Markov models, like particle filtering, can be conducted in a much more sophisticated way. And on occasion, I've, I've thought about having my students pursue more sophisticated investigations with them. But um, um, those weren't in evidence yesterday. But in the afternoon, uh, in the morning, but in the afternoon, we did explore a more sophisticated method known as particle filtering. And particle filtering is a method that, that seeks not one true explanation into which we put all our eggs in the, that basket about the underlying situation. We just count on that being true. Rather, it's, it's an exemplar of what might be called informally in an uh, a, in a ensemble method, in the sense that many competing hypotheses jostle for explaining the data that we see. We have, at any one time in this, this model, in this model positing some patterns of change in the world, maybe it's it's patterns of um, infection with, uh, with measles. At any one time, different particles have different hypotheses about how many people are in each stock of that model. How many people are infected or, or, or recovered or susceptible or what have you. Um, and those different hypotheses each are associated with a weight that reflects how much that hypothesis has accorded with observed data to this point. And over time, the model runs and those particles evolve. In between times where observations come in, the particles just run forward in the model as solitudes from each other. Um, each one is just put through the normal dynamics of the model. They evolve over time. And then when a new observation comes in, that 
that is where the the extra mechanism comes in. We we will adjust the weight of the particle. We'll see some of the details of that this morning to reflect how well it accords with this new data point in addition to the old ones. Particles that posit an underlying situation that's more consistent with what we observed in that new data point will be upweighted. Their weight will be increased. We'll reward them. We'll say, you know, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you've done a great job in predicting this. Um, we'll upweight your, your uh, weight to reward you for your good prediction. Models that are, are, or particles that mispredict what should be going on. Maybe there's a particle that thinks there's very, very few susceptibles and there's an observation of a lot of infections. That, that particle would have its weight dinged, it would have its weight decreased. And uh, it, would, uh, it would become a, a sort of a particle non grata. Um, it would be a particle that's that scene is not very competitive, it's not very fit in light of the data. So we upweight the weight of particles that accord with the data, that are consistent with the data, that jive with the, the new data point. We downweight particles that are, that are uh, inconsistent with the data. And then on an occasional basis, there'll be a, what's called a resampling process, whereby particles that are too low weight get weeded out, and those that are high weight get multiplied. And that's according to something called multinomial resampling. So we, um, we basically have n particles going into it and n particles coming out of it. And uh, all we do is a multinomial draw from the particles with a probability of, um, associated with each uh, given by its weight. Um, I may mutter about that more later, but for those interested in the underlying implementation, it's multinomial draw in character. But what this means is that over time there's a survival of the fittest of, of particles where fitness is determined by how much they accord with the data. So we have many competing hypotheses for what's going on in the world and the ones that are consistent time after time are multiplied heavily. Those that are you know, sometimes consistent are still likely to hang in there and things that are, that are in non-competitive hypotheses die out. And over time, as observation comes in, it hones our understanding of what the underlying situation is. What the underlying situation is in terms of states, but also what the underlying situation is in terms of some parameter values that evolve over time. So we saw this yesterday for several models, and Shaw Yen and presented a couple herself with um, uh, particles, and, or excuse me, with pertussis and with measles. Um, each one having an aggregate model, and in fact, several different age-structured models um, created. And Anahita um, uh, showed us a model for, for influenza, one of several that she's worked on very successfully, uh, been the, the key lead for. Those models were distinguished um, from each other by some features. Xiao uh, yeah, worked with some uh, historical data um, of considerable length uh, involving uh, pertussis and measles uh, um, and, and demonstrated how a model could be used to accord, to account for these patterns historically. At any one point, like any particle filter model, it's, it's seeking to reconstruct the full state of the system at that time with the multiple continuous variables that are involved. How many people at a given time were susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered with respect to measles, and potentially so at, at different age groups. She was able to show how a model like that, by virtue of its ability to estimate what's going on at a given time, estimate the full latent state of the system, it could be used to project forward with uncanny accuracy sometimes, with, with, with sig very significant accuracy, what's likely to be coming down the pike in the next six months, sometimes as long as a year or two. Although each of those, those uh, pathogens, each of those uh, associated illnesses with 
pertussis and with measles um, uh, was subject to um, some different challenges for, for anticipating what's coming. But that projection that she was doing, this is a key point, ladies and gentlemen, the, the projection that she was doing was not based on any sort of curve fitting of the number of cases of infection in the past. No, it wasn't based on that. That dependence on observables alone, that's, that's somewhat impoverished in terms of understanding what's going on. Curve fitting doesn't get us very far, typically, in real world complex systems. And the types of systems Shaoyan or, or Anahita were looking at, it doesn't, it doesn't cut it much. Operating in terms of observables and trying to connect the dots um, or trying to project forward, extrapolate. Those, those sort of um, naive approaches tend to fall flat and sometimes very um, painfully flat when conducted with, with um, nonlinear systems, with complex systems, such as we're routinely struggling with uh, in a public health front. Rather, her projections were based on grounded in a reconstruction of the underlying state of a complex system, which allowed it to capture the fact of the underlying dynamics of that system, the underlying logic of that system. So when she projected forward, it was not on the basis of some sort of curve fitting, but a grounded understanding of what the underlying situation is that's, that's mechanistic in character, and that allowed her to recognize, well, as more people get infected, the number of susceptibles will be drained, and the number of infectives will rise, but then people will recover. And that leads to a much, much more robust accounting for what's likely to happen going forward. This ain't no traditional curve fitting. This is based on a grounded mechanistic understanding of the structure of the system, a capacity to reconstruct that underlying system, the, uh, reconstruct the state of the underlying system, and a look forward based on that. That's much more powerful than, than simply connecting the dots and trying to extrapolate, which is a fool's errand when it comes to, to real world complex systems. Now in Anahita's case, um, she, her, her model was recommended uh, by a notable innovation. To wit, the incorporation of a data source traditionally neglected in the epidemiological investigation, um, which is the use of online search data that, that might indicate not whether one person is sick, but whether they are concerned about illness, whether they have um, anxiety, perhaps, um, or a degree of consternation about that illness. And she made use, she complemented clinical data of, of rigorous character with data that would normally be considered somewhat unseemly, if I might say so, to, to in the health research sphere. Data from, from searches online of uncertain provenance, of uncertain implications. But what she showed was provocative as befits the nature of work in in complex systems, which challenges reigning shibboleths. Specifically, she showed that whilst one could attempt reconstruction of the underlying state of the system with traditional data sources, with data sources that are based on observations from clinical data of higher caliber, the capacity of the model to operationally anticipate what lay forward, to project forward effectively, was greatly compromised with that data. It offered a pale cipher um, compared to what was possible when one brought in the, social, the data from online communicational behavior, from search data as well. She found adding search data, well, data of a lower quality level 
it actually very materially improved the ability of the model to make sense of what was observed and to project forward, not just not just project forward the number of searches that are likely to take place, but indeed the number of incident cases likely to come about over the next period of time. So she found that somewhat counterintuitively for those used to thinking in a linear way about things, adding in a lower quality data source can improve the quality of the output. That again is a provocative finding, but it's one that's reflected in the underlying truth uh, of the situation that we're adding in information. Yes, on a per data point basis, the information is, is limited uh, compared to the quality of original clinical data sets. On the other hand, it, it unquestionably contains added information. It's added information about another part of that system. Another part of that system concerning people's behavior concerning their, their likelihood of, of exposing themselves to flu or their concerns about exposing themselves to flu, which, which proved very instrumental in explaining the patterns that we see in predicting forward. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, I would argue that all too often and in health and other cognate fields, we have crucified an understanding of the world upon the cross of easy measurability. We have privileged things that are all too often easy to measure um, and, and uh, not collected at all or collected only in a limited way. Um, uh, types of information which could lend great insight to the situation but relate to aspects of human behavior that are harder to characterize, harder to measure with confidence. And yet, in the sphere of, 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 of health outcomes, human behavior is writ large as a determiner of, of, of effective, um, of, of some of the, the drivers of outcomes. Whether it's um, uh, looking beyond the efficacy of the vaccine as measured in, in tightly scripted clinical trials that control for many of the real world things that vary in, and day-to-day day -day life. Or whether it's, um, and, and looking beyond that, to ask about, about the degree to which people will actually go for the vaccine or the concerns of the vaccine. Um, or whether it's, it's aspects of thinking about HIV spread, where we need to broaden our understanding of the, of the biomedical understanding of HIV to an understanding of, of patterns of risk behavior, perception of risk, um, people's, uh, uh, people's reaction to the availability of, uh, of drugs that, that make HIV less of an immediate death sentence, um, but have, uh, have the impact on elements of, of uh, risk, risk taking. We need to recognize that human behavior and other aspects of, of human perception and belief are often of key importance in anticipating what lies forward. And, and all too often, data sets that would give us those insights have been shunted aside in favor of data sets from um, very tightly controlled circumstances like randomized con clinical trials that, that, are, that are precise in their measurement but so tightly conscripted as to provide us limited insight into uh, real world um, impact uh, in terms of effectiveness. So, Particle filtering here provided us a way to incorporate not just the highest quality clinical data sets, but lower quality data sets that added information. And the statistics literature recognizes the value of, of data that's, um, that has greater degree of variability as contributing information and indeed contributing to estimation even though it is of lower quality. And, and Anahita's particle filtering, uh, by incorporating that, was able to achieve much greater predictive capacity. I hope that those exercises, and it was not merely a, a hope, it was um, an observation of um, uh, encouragement 
that a lot of the questions surrounding these case studies seem to recognize the manifest value of, of the fact of, of viewing different data sets, longitudinal data sets here, observations over time, not as solitudes, not as fragmented, uh, fragmented sets of observations, each in their own world, but as relating to their different faces of a common underlying latent situation. We're, it's like this in the world. It's not merely like this for population level issues, as Anahita and, and Shalyan examined. It's like this if we want to understand a whole person as well at the case management level. If we're dealing with the youth under protection, if we're dealing with a criminal justice issue and, and a possible offender, if we're dealing with a person struggling with the burden of opioids, often any one type of measurement will fall short in our understanding about what's likely occurring. We may try to guess about what's occurring from some of those measurements. Some of them might bring out salient factors. But what we'd really like to have is a more rich picture of what's going on um, in, in this person's situation more broadly. Um, what are their underlying states of ideation? What are their um, uh, possible triggers in terms of, of turning them towards pro-social or anti-social companionships? What are some of the um, factors that are shaping their, their underlying behavior in terms of uh, those uh, aspects of socialization or aspects of their environment? To what degree are um, treatment mechanisms or counseling mechanisms or social worker visits nudging them towards the better? This is not something we can undertake with any one sort of data in isolation. It's something that multiple sources of data we hope will help us triangulate, help us, help us understand what that underlying situation is and from, from a multidimensional perspective. And what I presented yesterday should be, should be thought provoking in that area as well because we're dealing with a depiction here, ladies and gentlemen, with these systems models that I introduced in the first day. Not of the pieces of the elephant in isolation. Not of you know, the trunk over here with its data set and the leg over there with its data set um, in isolation, but rather these are models of the entire elephant. And we have bits of data on the different pieces of the elephant that try to help us understand what's going on internally. The analogy I gave two days ago, which some may remember, despite all of my droning since then. <laughs> Jeff is going to have a good time talking with Christine throughout the day here today. Um, the, the under, these models that we're dealing with depict these complete underlying situations. And I argued that they allow us to reason about an underlying situation where we have only imperfect information on certain parts, but they depict the underlying latent, uh, latent factors in their evolution over time. And what we saw yesterday was a systematic way with particle filtering of inferring that underlying situation given the evidence and regrounding the model in the current understanding of the situation, reflecting that without that regrounding, the model will grow increasingly divergent from situation in the world. Here, we are regrounding it so that the model incorporates the latest understanding of what's going on so that we can look forward effectively. Um, and so that we can ask what if questions about what would help, um, help improve the situation in the greatest way. It's this ability to leverage data science to infer that underlying situation in a system science model that provides us such power. And that is the noble task that we are pursuing this week. It's exploring these methods to bring together the insights from data science with the capacity to characterize the evolution of the world from system science. To bring them together, not merely in an additive way, but in a synergistic way. 
to achieve the greatest potential of both. Okay. Um, so, so those models we saw yesterday, while well, at a population level, they should be getting you to think, could we depict things at an individual level in that way? Could we knit together multiple lines of data to, to illuminate what's going on? The example I gave was this uh, CT scan or, or an MRI scan, where from the world, we only have very imperfect data. We have data from different angles and slices uh, from, uh, from the CT scan, slide into it, it, it sort of takes x-rays from different angles of you. Each of those x-rays is very limited. It only depicts a certain cross-section of the body and there's occlusion from propagation of the rays. They can't go past certain uh, bones or, or, or metal inserts and so it casts shadows. And, and any one of those images is terribly, terribly limited. It's terribly, terribly incomplete. But what emerges from many of them, knit together by other data science techniques, is a three-dimensional picture. A three-dimensional picture of the underlying structure. Our system science techniques, so part of filtering, give that to us. But they give it to us more than that. They give it to us jointly with the system science model over time. Over time that allows us to see, as it were, and 3D, the beating heart of the systems that are driving the spread of measles or driving suicidal ideation on the part of an individual. Okay, so, so this is the, the unity that, that we are seeking to achieve. And uh, I hope that in the course of the week, this vision will inspire you as much as it inspires me. Okay. So I think I'm going to um, uh, wrap up my uh, retrospective remarks, the floor though they are, with, uh, with those comments. Is, is there, are there any questions that might have come out of, out of the past few days of, of work, recognizing that my answering your questions and addressing your needs is the foremost goal of this boot camp? Questions? Challenges? Yes? Um, I'm just trying to figure out Particles, these hypotheses. Yes. Are they the, the reactor is there kind of fair, it's just kind of like a rank, like a uniform distribution. But are, do you ever are they ever based on like previous history or uh, other data? Like I'm thinking of uh, like you're modeling someone's health trajectory. Yeah. Would you get the hypotheses from other people's health trajectories? Good question. Good question. Um so so the particle so at a given time in the model, the distributions we see for particles um, are shaped by two primary factors, with a third entering in, particularly early in the model. Um, one factor is the evolution, the logic of the underlying system science model itself. Each particle. It's, it's like uh, uh, not far from here, um, over on yonder bridge. Um, if you were to bring um, you know, small uh, shims of wood and you were to toss them into the river, yet flowing, um, you would see them swirl in the current and trace a path. An arc is driven by the underlying flows of water. Each particle is like that in the model. It, um, uh, if, if you put it in place at a given time, it will evolve according to the logic of the model until the next observation. There's nothing other than the logic of the model that, that sends it swirling this way or that in terms of the, the evolution of its value. And so the logic of the model is a big shaper of what we see in terms of the, the particle values. But beyond that, another key shaper is the what happens at the observation. What happens at the observations is that some particles are upweighted and some particles are downweighted. Some particles are rewarded because they've been consistent with the data, and others are, are downweighted. And, and essentially, what you saw on their screens, on the screens of Shah Yen or on the screens of, of Anahita, were samples from those particles. So, particles that are very low weights were very unlikely to be sampled. Um, Particles that had high weights would have been sampled a lot. So those bands, those kind of um, 
density plots, um, those histograms, if you would slice them in time, consider them for that time, they're a histogram. Um, those 2D histograms is, is the technical term for using them in the packet. Those, um, those actually result also, they're shaped heavily by the observed data, right? And so the particles essentially that are consistent with the data are the ones that are well represented. And that's why they hug the data so well. So uh, Xiaoyan showed, showed how with measles, you know, as the measles cases go up and down empirically, um, the particles that are consistent with that are well rewarded, and hence they have high, um, high um, uh, weights. And therefore, those, those bands around, uh, those blue bands that were around the, the, the um, red particles were indicative of the particles that were you know, highly weighted at that point. Um, and finally, particles are affected by the uh, initial distribution. And you, you noted there were some uh, uniform distributions used. Uh, the only place uniform distributions would be used would be for the initial state of phenomenon. Um, and, uh, and so those patterns uh, that we saw there, um, that you see, the, the patterns that emerge over time, they're coming from those three different sources. Um, and uh, if you were asking, could we inform those particles, for example, in, let's say in their initial state, by data from other patients? Yes, I think actually that would be a fine source. I mean, because right now, the initial, the initial state of the model, like when we start those models off, the particles are scattered. They, they have the same weight. We don't have any evidence to suggest one is more highly weighted than the other. And they are scattered over uniform intervals um, uh, for many, many of their initial values. And Shayan didn't really show this, but she spent a great many hours at times trying to cap craft an initial state that is consistent with what's observed. And I suspect that he may have done the same. Um, so there, data from another another individual could be really helpful to give a best early guess as to what's going on um, you know, at the initial state. Often, the initial state of the model is often kind of the neglected stepchild of the situation with the dynamic model. Because after that, the logic of the model takes care of shaping things. But at the initial state, we often have little understanding about what the patterns are. And so we of, of the latent situation. And so we just you know, scatter a bunch of things in there according to crude mechanisms like uniform distributions. The effects of those die out over time as the model logic, the inexorable logic of the model takes over. But um, I could imagine a really nice use of data from another patient, which would basically give you a more informed understanding about what's likely going on at the initial time. So that would be very, very good. It's, it's a very good idea. I've, I've actually not stopped to consider that, but um, I like it very much. Yeah. yeah. Other, did that answer some of your questions? Okay. Other, other questions? Yeah. Uh, so just on that kind of, or moving off of that, mm. if we ha had a model, for example, that yeah. was developed for different patients, yeah. but then say very different uh, etiology, Yes. Would it be actually possible to move backward then? And if certain models tend to be the most suitable, it could allow us to inform us to identify what the different etiologies would be for different populations or given certain uh, certain information that we get on different people, essentially. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, uh, th this idea of of um, helping, helping to identify an underlying etiology uh, associated, say, with a pathology of a given patient um, uh, based on which model most accords with or, or can best account for their, um, their conditions 
is indeed, in my view, a very good use of these methods, and I would argue a very realistic use of these methods. It is also a use which has, to my knowledge, not yet seen um, use, um, and which would be very attractive, uh, and I believe these methods would be very responsive to it. I would, I would um, just put out there one um, counter question, which, uh, uh, or, or one observation about something I would think about, having built now a dozen or so of these models for different needs, or um, uh, different areas, uh, 12 to 15 different areas. I, in, in my view, uh, when we have different etiologies, um, so when we're thinking about etiologies, uh, we're thinking about different mechanisms of disease, different mechanisms of the underlying pathology. And um, there's, there's a question in my mind about the degree to which you'd want to use different models to probe those etiologies, um, which would might might you know each depict different types of dysfunction um, pathologically, or whether indeed you might um, within a single model uh, depict uh, depicting multiple pathways uh, that are that are relevant to this disease um, pathologies. Uh, might, different pathologies could be represented by different parameter values in that model. So you might have one pathology which you know um, is associated with this type of um, hematological uh, disorder. Um, uh, so thrombomegalothrombocytopenia, uh, and another one associated with anemia, and another one associated with. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, some type of, of morphological disorder, maybe a specific type of, of sickle cell anemia. And I can imagine within the same model, you you just adjusting parameters to represent different um, etiologies of disease. So in other words, it wouldn't be an entirely different model which would be needed. It would rather be the same model, but with different um, parameter regimes, different sort of uh, parameters holding different values for different pathologies. And personally, if I were to approach it, that's how I, I, I put my money down on that approach because that allows you with a single model to, to infer, and I think this could be done in a quite nice way, to infer for a given patient what are the likely um, the likely situation for that patient as far as uh, pathways of disease, okay? And, and one of the reasons I like this is because a given patient might have, uh, could in some cases have m multiple uh, disorders related to a single system of their body. And you could, you could simultaneously represent a patient, you know, with a, a patient who has simultaneously multiple related disorders Within a, a within that single model, rather than depending on multiple models uh, as as solitude. So I think you could infer using these approaches, and um, and some of what you saw uh, Xiao Yan uh, present yesterday, or uh, to some degree on Hita as well. Um, you know, they're inferring the value of certain parameters in the model based on the observed data, and it's not just one parameter; it's multiple parameters. This afternoon, um, or tomorrow morning, as time allows, we'll be seeing a more powerful technique yet, known as uh, particle Marco chain Monte Carlo, which allows estimation of latent, uh, of, of, of static uh, variables, or static parameters. Um, it allows us to estimate the sample from the distribution for them, which would also be very powerful in the technique you're talking about. So not only do I think it's um, possible, I think uh, it certainly is. It's it's feasible with with these methods. It is important. It is doable, and it's underserved. So um, I, I think I think what you uh, what you suggested there um, could be a very attractive um, application of these methods. Yeah. And as an extension to that, so would it then would we be able to potentially use different sets of parameters to? essentially identify new illnesses 
in its own way. So for example, for a given symptom, if we have no idea what's actually causing it, we suspect that it's multiple different causes, but we have no idea what it is, so we can't actually identify it ourselves, would we be able to create a model where certain sets of parameters or certain patterns are common and then it essentially informs us, hey, well, all these people are likely the same cause and then maybe we should figure out what's causing these specific populations. Um, could in principle be done. The, the primary uncertainty I have in answering um, that question is um, the degree of of, uh, of, of strong uh, understanding of the biologic pathways that already exists uh, related to this. Um, I've done, I would say, a modest, uh, a moderate amount of um, within the body modeling um, physiology, much of it related to uh, immunology and immunoepidemiology. Um, uh, Tina uh, back there has done quite a bit with, for example, modeling of HIV-related uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, uh, but but I, I don't know the modeling space in that area physiologically enough to know how well is that mapped out. If it's mapped out reasonably well um, in terms of the requisite sort of uh, biological pathways, I would... Uh, um, physiological pathways in some uh, areas, then I would think, yes, that, that should, be, uh, should be possible. It's not trivial. I mean, this is not something where, you know, within a month's time, you'd be able to cluster all these patients. But, you know, with a year or two of concerted work on something like that, I think you could have all sorts of, of, of insights as long as you can build on some plausible uh, physiologic models uh, that already exist, or or that, um, that that could be assembled from um, existing evidence or and, and understanding, uh, I would think that that could be a you know a large part of a career is is exploring those topics. And I would suggest that you talk with some of the grad students here, um, particularly Xiao Yan or or Anahita or um, or, or Tina. Who, um, who might have uh, additional insights. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I think that's very exciting. I'm glad to talk with you further about it to explore what's needed. I'd also suggest Jeff back there on, in the back row. Um, uh, and uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, being an MD himself uh, and having uh, considerable familiarity with the physiological modeling, I'm sure might be a, a good point to uh, consultate. Yeah. Question? I have a question, which is a, a comment for uh, his question. Mm. So he asked if like, uh, if he has different data for different patients. So like the, gen, um, like the generic idea is like to train a model for one patient, but like his extension is if he can use the data set of all the patients to uh, infer like what of let, let's say H, um, patient A, like what uh, to improve the model. So uh, based on my knowledge, uh, there is uh, a few uh, tweaks that we can do that. So uh, the simplest way is to um, let, let's say like all of them uh, come with the same heart disease, for example. So basically the underlying mechanism is the same, but each individual can have some different parameters, like they might belong to different age group or different weight, height, or something like that. Um, but the general idea is some of the parameters might come from the same distributions. Mm -hmm. So you can either like characteristic those parameters individually, mm -hmm. or even simpler, uh, yeah. put a random defect on those uh, parameters, which allow you to use all the source of data to infer those parameters. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I think uh, <coughs> I think that it is true that you might um, you might have a model that that relates to certainly you'd want a model that. I mean, it, it's not going to be fruitful to say we're going to have a model of the human body. Um, We'll, we'll want models that are 
are organ, I mean, in, in your area, probably organ or, or system specific, and um, uh, or or might have multiple uh, co-linked uh, systems, but uh, you know that that are are not aspiring to a full biological accounting for human physiology. Um, uh, but um, uh, and and as such, you know, maybe you can deal with multiple sets of. Of patient data. Generally, I'm I'm not aware of a way that you know you would you, you wouldn't want to in a given run of the particle culture want to be feeding in data from multiple patients uh, at a time and, and you know like one patient first and then the next and then the next. Generally, you'd be doing it for for a given patient. It would have it in, uh, work to infer the latent state and the um, the parameter values for that patient. Um, it, but then you might be able to cluster from what's found there, you know, patients, and you might find that uh, in terms of their parameters, there's several latent clusters associated with different subgroups of patients, something along those lines. So um, I think this would be fruitful for some more exploration offline, um, uh, and I'd, I'd look forward to doing that, and, and we can talk further uh, about it. Okay, additional questions or comments? things people would like to discuss? Okay. Um, barring that, um, uh, what do you think, Christine? Um, uh, should I, um, uh, should we give people a break right now? Uh, yes, I think so. Oh, uh, a health break for, uh, for 10 minutes, and then we can, uh, uh, we can come together. So we've got a couple things going on uh, this morning, um, which are going to be, uh, uh, responsive to hopefully many of your needs. Number one, we're going to be going into a little bit of exploration about how particle filtering can be implemented. Uh, if any of you want to, to explore some of the models that we provided, you can do so. Um, secondly, I'm going to be talking about, I'll probably do this first because people are a little bit more focused in the morning. Um, a talk about uh, building on our knowledge of particle filtering. I waved my hands on a lot of things yesterday. I want to pin some things down. You pick some things up from the case studies, perhaps, but I want to make it more specific and and, and bring home a few points. Uh, thirdly, we'll uh, as as uh, the situation allows, we'll have a couple more case studies, um, uh, which will give you understanding of additional ways we can apply particle. Okay, so we'll break for 10 minutes now, and uh, then we'll jump into some, maybe what I'll do is I'll show you how you can run a model that's there, and those of you who want to engage in exploratory computation can do that, um, but those of you who would like to focus on the lecture can, uh, can do so as well. And uh, I'll then come back to that model and show some additional uh, features, okay? Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you here in 10 minutes.